Hello and welcome to a brand new edition of Inside Out on the Road, a show where we focus on individual stocks. With in-depth analysis, we also deep dive into financials, but also alert you about the key risk and the triggers going forward. But let's get straight to the first stock today. My colleague Sonal gets us his very special deep dive on Wellspun Living. Wellspin Living is a prominent leader in the home textile segment with a strong global presence in over 50 countries. Their product range includes bath linen, bed linen, rugs and carpets, wet pipes, needle punch as well. They cater to major clients such as Walmart, Costco, Macy's, Tesco and Ikea. This is about the global setup and a lot in the domestic markets as well. Additionally, Wellspin Living is diversified into flooring, contributing approximately 10% to their revenues. And there have been fluctuations and headwinds in the global markets. Let's talk about their financials in that case. Their revenue for 9 months stands at 7100 crore rupees, which compares with around 8100 crores in FY23 and 9300 in FY22. There have been variations in EBITDA margins and they have been between 14-18% to 18 during this period and profits have been between 200-550 to 550 crore rupees. The company has strong presence in export markets, the key markets like USA and UK. So to understand their strategy going forward, the penetration, the supply side and the overall business, let's take a deep dive and speak to the management now. Okay, as promised, it's time to understand everything about Wellspin Living, the strategy, the supply chain, and a lot more. Joining me today is Ms. Dipali Goyanka, the MD and CEO of the company. Such a pleasure to have you with us, closer Thank to you. Women's Day as well. So there's so much to talk about. But first up, let's start with the basics. And I want to understand when an investor is looking at your company, do they look at you like a retailer? Do they look at you like a textile company? Because you're across the supply chain, I believe. Can you explain to us those various steps in the supply chain? Where do we see Wellspin living there? So I'll tell you one thing. Wellspin Living is a new name that we, you know, uh, changed a couple of months back. And it actually really defines what Wellspin India is now. It is a complete home solutions company. So we are, in, we are into home textiles. We have our factories across Anjar, Wapi and Telangana. A completely integrated supply chains, vertically integrated for spinning, weaving, um, processing and the cut and sew for towel, sheets, rugs, fashion bedding, but now flooring as well. Um, I mean, we're doing the hot flooring, which you can set up in six hours, or, you know, the wall-to-wall -wall carpets, the carpet tiles, and also the baby wipes and the wet wipes. So it is about now, I, I can say it is about, you know, a woman, what she needs in the 24 hours. And I think that's what it defines. It's not just about home textiles, it is about home solutions. Um, more so, I must tell you, because we have never worked as a manufacturer. We've always kept the consumer in mind, whether it's a consumer in America, UK, Europe, Southeast Asia, or India. We have a brain trust in America where we reach out to 3,000 home enthusiasts who talk about what is relevant to them. Or so, you know, it is like we always say, in principle, we are a home solution company and also an FMCG for textiles. Okay, FMCG for textiles and home solutions company. In that case, um, um, since you're saying you're across the supply chain, are you able to control or take uh, take stock of what's happening on the supply side when it comes to crop plantation, when then it comes to your factory, you're talking about spinning, and then ultimately it's going to the consumer's house. How do supply side issues impact you? How do you deal with them? So um, definitely, I'll tell you, uh, textiles is a complex supply chain. And I, I must tell you, we actually, um, cotton, cotton is an integral part of what we do in home textiles, right? Um, we are working with farmers as well. 
uh, in Maharashtra, in, in uh, Gujarat, and in Telangana. And we, uh, we work with, our teams are working with them, showing them how the crop needs to be grown. And we have the BCI crop, you know, the better cotton initiative crops that are growing across these fields. Um, so the entire supply chain, and we have actually uh, experts, you know, uh, buying our cotton. And also the traceability and the entire blockchain is completely uh, looked at when we buy our cotton. Uh, very interesting thing in the phenomena that's happening in the supply chain of cotton is that India is now not only the biggest producer of cotton, but the biggest exporter of cotton. Mm. Because in the Xinjiang cotton in China actually, um, actually basically um, has been now disrupted and it's India which has become the prime sourcing country uh, for cotton. Even when you, you know, when you're talking about the United States of America, we, during the disruption that happened with the supply chain, yes. we, we actually partnered with a startup called Shipsy, which actually tells us where our ships are, you know, on the go, and whether they're hitting the shores, and how does that, you know, reach our warehouses. So the entire visibility, I would say, in short, from the point of sale to the manufacturing, to our vendors, is completely, we have a visibility on that as well. Um, you spoke about US, you spoke about Europe, you do have a big clientele there as well. Um, you know, we speak about geographical headwinds sometimes, mm -hmm. and that's what we've been True talking that. about in the US for mm -hmm. the last couple of uh, quarters as well. Um, is there any plan to change that mix? Would you keep focusing on the US? And how do you tap clients? You know, America, let's talk about uh, the entire world right now in the terms of the headwinds that you spoke about. I've always maintained that USA actually has, is the most resilient economy. Um, I know the Fed rates and the highest inflation at 8%, which was like the, the highest ever. But it has come down. The Fed, Fed is going to cut the rates this and you know uh, this year, um, and the inflation is a bit controlled now. It's around 3.4%. Um, we are also looking at you know people projected the growth in America, with that kind of uh, GDP of a country, you know we will maintain a steady state of growth of around say around 2.4% this year as well in America in the terms of the overarching economy that we're looking at. Um, Europe and UK are a little challenging though, mm -hmm. as we see. Um, India is the brightest spot and of course GCC as well. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you see how the KSA, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is like shaping up mm -hmm. and, you know, they're opening up the entire economy uh, and the development there. So I see this is the way we are looking at it. It's, it's kind of a mixed bag. And now having said that, um, our operations remain in America as well. Mm -hmm. We are spread across the globe. Uh, we right now have three warehousings, you know, one in Tacoma on the West Coast, Midwest we have in Ohio, Grove City, the other in Suffolk. And we have our offices uh, in New York and even in Bentonville um, and, uh, and our design studios across. Because I think you need to have the pulse of the country as well. UK, we have our offices for Christie uh, in Manchester, which is our own brand and which also services that side. We also have a warehousing in Germany, Munich to service our uh, hospitality partners and of course India. Uh, India has our factories and our offices as well and our design studios as well. Okay, interesting. So, um, you know, when you speak about uh, Europe, you speak about US as well. Um, how much is export as a part of the overall revenue pie? And do you see margins better? Are you able to sell at a better price when you go abroad? So, um, I must talk about a few things here to you. Um, so, you know, we will continue to have a pie of uh, exports and India growing, of course. Um, so if I say, um, you know, by 2026, end of 2026, 27, we are looking at, you know, 45% of our emerging businesses taking on the centerfold. That is our domestic retail, our uh, flooring and advanced textile. And the rest continue, will, continue, will continue to grow. We are targeting around uh, 15,000 crores by, you know, end of 2026. Um, and, and that's the steady state that we're going to be maintaining. So, um, you know, it's going to be... Um, it's going to be a story together. Yeah. So India definitely is evolving. Uh, the CAGR of 30% will be maintained here. USA will be a very integral part of our strategy, of course, and along with Europe and, uh, you know, UK. Now, when you talked about the margins and everything, let me just give you a perspective. Uh, we, we are uh, working with the private labels and all the retailers. We are the strategic partners to most of them. Um, and the interesting thing is the share of shelf. And uh, the share of shelf could be in a form of private label or the licenses. We have a license for Martha Stewart in America, 
um, uh, we also work with influencers there who actually give us that opportunity to not only talk about towel and sheets, but different things like, you know, uh, fashion bedding, flannel, throws, cushions. So that actually gives you the share of shelf, not only in, uh, you know, the retailers that we work with, but the other, other uh, retailers. Now, UK and Europe, we have a license for Disney there. Um, and you would look at a steady state of, you know, kind of uh, the retailers who work there. But there are a lot of retailers in East Europe, the other parts of uh, Europe as well, that we get an access to. Uh, that, again, is a very interesting opportunity that we see. Um, and, of course, India with the brands like Spaces and Wellspun yeah. that we have. So, yeah, um, uh, margins are something that will be... Uh, will, will, will I think always be, uh, you know, you have to work with the consumer at the centerfold. How competitive are you? And I think when you're in a global arena where we are as, uh, as well spun and also the other Indian manufacturers, I think we're competing with the rest of the world. And I think how competitive can we be is a very important and interesting opportunity that we are looking at. And I think it's an opportunity. So, you know, you mentioned that you'll be able to do uh, 15,000 crore rupees of revenues uh, by 2026. That's an interesting number. That would mean a CAGR of 27%, right? Yes. Uh, will there be additional products coming in that kitty or the geographical split that you spoke about, GCC, India contributing a lot? That is the factor for this number. You know what? Uh, there are huge opportunities here. So now when I, when I talk about, uh, uh, one is the products that we are talking about. Now, now let me talk about flooring here. Yeah. Uh, which actually will be around 2,700 crores um, uh, in year of, you know, 26, end of 26, 27, that time. Uh, we basically have a great opportunity there. The China plus one really plays a big role here, uh, where, uh, you know, USA, UK, Europe, and India. India, look at the kind of institutions and hospitality that are developing. So I think that's something that we will uh, definitely work on. Uh, retail. Uh, retail, we are talking about 1,700 crores by that time. Um, that again is a great opportunity. You know, we already are present in more than 17,000 stores, targeting around 50,000 stores that, that by that time. Again, that's another opportunity. Um, different products because of our licenses that we have could be something that we're working on. There's another brand that we have is Christie, um, uh, which does the towel for Wimbledon. That is something will become a very big D2C play as we grow forward. Um, and also, I think this is the time when, you know, um, you're talking about where uh, the opportunities also could be inorganic. Is there a kitty that you have in mind for inorganic opportunities? Because you've spoken about it earlier as well in conversation with CNBC TV 18. And you did indicate that if there is a possibility, we are up for it. Is there something in mind? What kind of inorganic opportunity? Um, we are exploring a lot of them. It could be uh, in the terms of a product, in the terms of a, you know, kind of a distribution, uh, like you have your offline and online, there are other opportunities there as well. So yeah, looking at acquiring something that can add value to us and could be not only, it could be a, you know, um, a different market accretive or a top line accretive or a margin accretive. So yeah, we'll explore that and uh, yeah, there are opportunities. We've spoken about a whole host of things. Let's see the products as well, because that's an interesting kitty. So let's go for that and we'll discuss uh, Take the for discussion forward. Let's go. Okay, so we've come here and there's so many products, so <laughs> that looks pretty cool. You've spoken about a lot of CapEx, it's happening at Anja, it's happening generally, globally. Um, what's the kitty that you have in mind for that? What, it, what would it do to your balance sheet in terms of your debt? Um, and how do you maintain the working capital in that case? So, um, so the plant that's coming in in Anjar uh, will ramp up our complete uh, jacquards and a fashion uh, bath towels and towels there. Um, and uh, it is around, uh, the investment is around 430 crores. But um, let me just tell you, uh, while this investment is all very, very focused, even the pillow plant in America, um, we definitely are going to maintain our uh, debt at, you know, sub-1,000. Uh, sub that's it. Uh, and, you know, that's what we wanted to. And we're talking about net zero by 2026. And I always believe that there is an op if there's an opportunity, mm -hmm. go for it. Because I think if the business looks good and if there's an opportunity, there is some kind of, you know, um, uh, you know uh, uh, that we can take on the market share there and uh, leadership there is something we'll continue to evolve as well. 
and that can be seen on ground as well. So CNBC change maker, congratulations on that. That's amazing. Uh, how do you look at Wellspin Living as a brand, say 10 years down the line? What are your strategies that you think are different and nobody, you've not spoken to anybody about it? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, of course, India will be at the heart of what we do because, yes, India is that bright spot and the opportunity is immense here. Um, and definitely that's going to be a very important aspect of it. So, uh, we are continuing to grow here through MBOs. We're also looking at the FOFOs as well. So, that, that will be something that um, we will be doing from, you know, Kashmir to Kanyakumari mm -hmm. and from Anjar to, uh, you know, Assam uh. is what we are looking at the base to be. Um, and um, it will continue to grow here. Um, but I will also not lose sight on uh, my other markets as well because I feel uh, United States will continue to evolve as well. Mm -hmm. And India is in a very sweet spot for everyone. You're looking at a lot of people commit committing to, uh, you know, buying from India. Like look at Walmart, $10 billion. There's Uniqlo who's looking at India. Everybody is looking at India uh, becoming a part of their sourcing supply chain. I think that's humongous. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot not neglect that and oversight that. So yes, that's again a very interesting opportunity. Um, and uh, um, I, you know, hospitality, let me tell you, is again very important. Mm -hmm. So while we're talking about retail chains, but America as well are positioning in a lot of, like, you know, the IG properties that you go to and the other in India as well. Um, you, you look at that becoming a very interesting space for us. What, according to you, apart from, of course, the big growth story in India, you as being a resilient economy, could be a possible risk that you think, um, if it comes by, we are ready for it. It's something that is a possibility. Um, I think there's a risk everywhere and I always say that, you know, um, we anyway are very cautiously optimistic about whatever we do. But I, we saw that, you know, two years back in the terms of our commodities, yeah. you know, in the terms of cotton, coal and the entire supply chain, the, you know, we, we just, it went for a toss, mm -hmm. right? Uh, cotton just went up like absolutely as if it was like gold. Um, coal, you know, yeah. or the, the entire energy basket yeah. was co simply, completely awry. The, the whole freight, mm. oh my God, that was a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we said, this is enough. Mm -hmm. How are we taking our destiny in our hand? Mm. And how are we going to find solutions for ourselves? Mm. So how are we looking at cotton? We, we are now, you know, because post, post COVID, mm. the world is not the same. It whether is. it's a consumer demand, whether it's in the terms of the commodity, everything is now, mm. you know, in a kind of a, it's, in a, it's completely all right, right? So how are we going to be buying cotton? How are we looking at it? It's the same thing like Forex, you know. How are we going to keep a tab on that is something that we work on on a regular basis. So my half an hour every day goes in to keep that check on that as well. So the cotton is very, very uh, important. So yes, um, it's, uh, you know, these shocks are not... Uh, not in our hands, yeah, but it is the absorbers that you can put it on the way, right? And that's what we are doing here. And I think we will continue to do that. There are solutions to really, you know, mitigate those risks and we will, we will take care of that as well. That's what we wanted to understand. What's the strategy when events like COVID hit a company, right? And especially a sector which is so uh, focused on laborers, at the ground level to marketing at the top level. So thank you so much, Ms. Goenka. It was a lovely conversation, speaking thank about you. a whole host of things from business to strategy to life in general. So it was okay. a pleasure speaking with you. Same here too. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It was a delight. Okay. All right. With that, we'll take your leave. And with that, it's back to the studios. All right. That was an interesting deep dive into Wellspun Living. But for the time being, we'll slip into a short break. When you come back, we'll focus on another interesting stock. Ganesha Ecosphere. Welcome back here tuned in to Inside Out. Well, the stock on our spotlight segment today is Ganesha Ecosphere. And the key reason for the company coming on our radar is it's got an ESG element to it. They're adding capacities. They're also changing their business mix, which is moving towards marginal creative businesses. Well, let's get a little bit into the details. They recycle a significant share of India's pet bottle waste with 6 billion pet bottles recycled annually. They have a total capacity of around 168,000 and have relationships with clients across the globe. They're also recognized as an authorized bottler of Coca-Cola for supplying recycled resin pet chips. But how does their business model work? Well, the discarded pet waste, like bottles and containers, they collect it, 
They're sent for recycling, but these bottles are crushed to flakes. And then the recycled flakes are converted into pellets and resins, which are supplied to the consumers. Well, majority of the capacity is used to produce recycled polyester stable fiber and recycled polyester spun yarn from pet waste. And this is used by downstream units for t-shirts, body warmers, carpets, car upholstery, pillows, as well as toys. But they recently commissioned its Warangal unit in South India that has focus on value-added products like bottle-to-bottle -bottle chips and filament yarn chips. They are in process of increasing capacity of our pet granules, which is food-safe raw material made from empty pet packaging, which is used in food-grade applications. They've also got approvals from the key global and domestic regulators for food-grade applications. Well, this tilt towards using empty pet packaging in food-grade applications is very important. And I say this because it commands higher capex. That's due to stringent contamination norms, but also gives higher margins. And the impact of that is evident in the past quarter's results. And this is likely to improve further as the additional facilities come on stream. Well, the management has guided for revenue growth of around 40 to 50%, with EBITDA margins of around 15 to 16% in FY25, which will be led by the ramp up of the South plant. So the street is factoring in a surge in revenues and margin improvement in FY26, which makes the valuation picture palpable. Well, they're sitting on a net debt of around 600 crores, but they raised 500 crores via QIP and promoter infusion. That's what will be used for the further expansion from year on. Well, let's wind this down then with the shareholding pattern of the company. The promoters hold 36%, but there are some marquee names in there as well. Well, we've completely run out of time on this edition of Inside Out. It's goodbye from Sonal and myself. You do write to us, tell us about companies you want us to discuss. We'll try to feature some of them on the show. Thanks a lot for watching.